So, the uh, direct electrical stimulation in fMRI is utilized in same methodology to study connectivity in the brain. And I wanted to tell you uh, that the study of connectivity is by no means yet another fashionable direction. You know, there are a lot of things people get excited about and, oh, it's trendy and we have to study connectivity. That's not the case. In fact, actually, it's a must. It's a must do kind of thing if we ever want to understand the brain. I'll tell you a few, um, many more things about uh, brain signals in the second uh, lecture and about details here. All of what I want to tell you is that brains are literally complex dynamic systems and they have properties that are not basically, uh, it's not possible to study them completely in isolation. For example, the three of them, I'll show a few more things actually in the second talk, uh, they have a huge number of elements you can see uh, the numbers in the, the, the level of millions and billions and of connections. They have very high structural connecti connectivity, which very often is irrational. You don't understand why things are the way they are connected. Um, project, uh, uh, po point A projects to point B, but then projects also to point C, and but B also goes to C, and the direction according to its feet forward or top down is completely of, of different, basically, specificity. So there is an very hard to understand connectivity at the micro and macro level. And on top of it, you have ill-defined elementary operational units that depend on the question you're asking. What's a unit? Is it a single uh, ion channel? Is it uh, basically a cell? Is it a group of cells? Is it a microcircuit? It's almost impossible to tell. The only way that such system can be studied is, is, studied is to approach them at different spatial and temporal scales at the very same time which unfortunately is not happening very often because of uh, technical problems. So um, the attempt that we did here to combine is you're gonna see electrophysiological methods with imaging methods is one direction that is promising, although it of course has also a lot of limitations and a lot of problems. Now, um, the connectivity traditionally has been studied with uh, degeneration studies, with conventional tracers, with transneuronal tracers, and genetically encoded tracers. They give you an incredible specificity and very, very high spatial resolution. It, it's really a wonderful approach. But the problem, as you may know, the, all these methods require fixed tissue. That means uh, you have to kill basically the animal and, and do post-mortem analysis. So it's impossible to use these studies for some kind of synergistic, basically, activity between anatomical connectivity and dynamic or effective connectivity that you can learn through physiological things. And it's impossible to constrain your physiological data because you do what you do, then you have to kill the animal, and then you have to do the studies, then you start with a different animal, it's a different condition. So uh, what you can do is you can use, of course, uh, and you are the best to know, there are a lot of very nice and sophisticated methods that tell you a few things about connectivity, whether these are basically the resting state studies or they are mm, things that rely on DTI and other anatomical uh, methods. But these methods have also limitations because you have certain degree of spatial resolution and you cannot go into details, particularly if you go into the areas where basically the anisotropy in diffusion happens to be actually much less because you have a lot of neurons and very few fibers. You can use paramagnetic tracers. We have been using this manganese-enhanced, basically, uh, M M M M MRI, uh, magnetic resonance imaging. They are very good. Uh, and we've been using them for over 10 years. And we improved all the pumps and all the materials that you need to do it. Um, but also, again, there are certain limitations because um, there is that much you can use that without after two or three or four applications to actually start causing some kind of uh, damage in the tissue. So the last methods that appear to be also limitations, I'll say it from the beginning, but they appear to be much more promising are the direct electrical stimulation in the magnet combined with fMRI and also the neural event triggered fMRI that's gonna be the topic of the next talk. Now, today we're talking about this, and what I want to say is, first of all, what you can do. We are interested entirely in basic research. 
uh, I have absolutely no question of research project or aims in translational research, but this happens to be a, one of the directions that could potentially, if it works and other people take over, be useful also for translational studies or for even applications in clinical studies. So the very first one is the in vivo connectivity. You can work and learn something about projective fields. I don't know if you know what um, people mean with that. Usually if you have neurons or a group of neurons and you stimulate them, you have targets that are direct connections that you can actually study very well where they are, what they do, and how they correlate to the local area that you're stimulating by using electrical stimulation. Then there is um, um, search of causality, so to speak, because uh, it is um, electrical stimulation for over 100 years has been seen one way to have effective connectivity. That means basically you see what the effects are of stimulation in a way that you can call it causal. And of course, you can study motor systems. That's the way it started. You can actually stimulate nervous tissue and cause movements and see exactly what is happening and what is not happening in the case that there are problems. Then there's network plasticity, which is really, really a good thing because with the electrical stimulation, as you know, people for many years have been trying to change plasticity and cause this long-term potentiation on other things. You can combine that with imaging and say, if there is local plasticity changes here and the structure modifies its functionality, what happens in the rest of the brain? Something you would never be able to do only with physiology and of course only with imaging. And then there are clinical applications, one of them that is really good if you can manage to have uh, on a trivial basis combination of stimulation of MRI is the story of eloquent areas. The eloquent areas is usually because the medical doctors, they don't wanna know too much about all the details and there are certain areas they know if they damage them during the operation, the, the patient is gonna look really bad. And there are certain areas, even if they are critical, and they do have a lot of basically effects on the behavior, on the perception, on the cognition of the person, they are a little more hidden, so you can kind of live with it if there is a damage. So uh, the very characteristic eloquent area, of course, is the speech areas and also the motor areas. If you actually damage them, then you have a person that cannot say anything, and the person cannot move, and so on. Now, the only way you can do surgery on these people and do it basically safely is to map. And in order to map, it's not enough actually to map movements, but would be enough to map connectivity. There would be very good application for these kind of approaches. Now, to do all these things and combine imaging with uh, direct electrical stimulation, the very first thing we did actually, to be quite honest, when um, I first started, that's about 20 years ago almost, uh, the idea was, to combine physiology with MRI, which we still do and will be doing, and it's gonna be also the topic of the next talk, because we wanted to record and have basically a micro scale uh, information combined with macro scale that is basically whole brain activity. And we started by putting together the systems that you see here. <coughs> they are all high field scanners. This is the 4.7 scanner, and this is basically the seven Tesla scanner. They have very strong gradients. They were selected sort for whatever the technology permitted at the time to give you the steeper, basically, slope for actually gradients. And they also have, they are also basically shielded so that they don't affect basically the environment that's gonna be full of different uh, types of uh, other equipment. So when the magnets came and they come still to, um, to the laboratories, they come literally naked, right? It's a magnet, it's a gradient coil, and there is a console, that's it. Uh, the rest we build ourselves. We have a very nice engineering group, a combination of computer scientists, physicists, engineers, and so on, and we do the whole thing of basically developing the equipment that can work with and around the magnet and give you signals at different levels. And here you see also the rat magnets. These two are for monkeys. The left one is for anesthetized monkey. This was for behaving monkey because it's larger, it's 60 centimeters. And you can have a chair that has all the equipment that the animal needs to report basically what the animal perceives. And these ones here, one with seven Tesla and the other is 16.4 Tesla is for um, rat studies. And now, needless to say, if you do that, I want 
Um, I'll spare you details. I'd be happy to talk later, whatever you want about all the details, because in most of the studies, I was to some extent personally involved. And we can talk about all these things, but the in, 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 uh, overview, to give you an overview, the very first thing you have to do is to develop basically RF coils yourself, and these RF coils, they have to be animal specific. Of course, they have, to, they have to be combined also with the recording chambers, with implants that you use to access directly the brain. You have to put together systems that measure the eye movements because you have to measure the eye movements of the animals during the behavior and see where it's looking. You have to put uh, all the electrodes together, the circuitry that deals with the near and the far interference in a second. I'll let you know what it is. And of course, mock setups for training the animals and different types of uh, sensors for movement. The, in the high field, movement is a nightmare. It was very nice and beautifully, actually, Mark explained to you about the shimming and all these things. Shimming in the beginning of the scans, you can completely forget it with animals. If in high field magnet, you don't need to move your head to cause artifacts. If you move your body or you move your leg like that, it's enough to change basically the field and you have to reshim. So you have to develop basically a process where basically you get signs that things have to, must have changed, and then on the basis of all these changes, do again and again and again the shimming if you want actually to, um, to have the good quality and good SNR images. And for that, we have sensors in the popo of the animal, we have sensors in here, and uh, every day the animals uh, learn in the mock setup within actually a week or two weeks to ignore completely these things because they don't cause anything. They just touch, and with this touching, basically, they tell you what's happening there. And with that, you can uh, combine behavior and the electrophysiology or pharmacology or electrical stimulation with fMRI. And the biggest, biggest problem that had to be solved, and this has been published several times in different journals, was the compensation for the induction. As you realize, uh, in high field magnets, to have very fast gradients, you can induce actually voltages at the tip of the electrode that, uh, that are at the level of 50 or 60 volts, you heard correctly. And what you try to measure is 200 microvolts. So I remember in 1998, I think, when we were having the first discussion, some people were looking at me with a big smile and said, you're really, really wasting your time. <laughs> And in FPN, it works, but it needs a lot of measurements. The difficulties, you need real-time measurements, because if you don't compensate and you don't understand what's happening, you don't develop the circuits, there is no way to do it offline because the system saturates. You know, you, no matter what, where you have 32 or 132 bits of A to D converters, at some point the signal is going to saturate. There's no way to take the signal without any compensation, go home, and then start doing your sophisticated analysis, basically, to get something out of it. So today, <coughs> what we can do is electrophysiology, NFMRI, neuropharmacology, capillary microsampling. We use for local chemistry, uh, manganese-enhanced fMRI, direct electrical stimulation, and the neural event-triggered imaging. So the very final thing related to the technology um, is methods basically that permit the access of deep nuclei. I was always interested to understand the neuromodulatory system. I worked, as correctly was said, and with a visual system, and this is what I did as a graduate student, and then later on as a, in the early postdoc phase, and I was very much interested and still interested in visual perception. There, is, uh, there are two or three groups in the department, they work on it. But eventually I became more and more interested in interstructural communication and things relate to memory or neuromodulation. And for that, you need to access basically parts of your brain that are very deep. You go 35, 40, or 50 millimeters. And if you go 50 millimeters, the chances you're going to hit vessels are high and you can cause, of course, trouble. And to avoid this, we developed a very nice method. Everything is basically subject specific. There are no generalized RF coils or basically chambers. Everything is specific. The uh, brain and the skull of the animal will be reconstructed in three dimensions. And, uh, and the placement, basically, of a chamber and the access with an electrode or particular structure is going to be done under computer guidance during the surgical procedures. So you know, basically, how to avoid vessels. And you know how to hit the structure that you want. Still with a risk, but this risk has been largely minimized. 
Now, here is what we can do today, and in order to do, in order to do electrical stimulation with the magnet, well, of course, you have to do specific to this topic a lot of technical developments. And this includes detailed characterization uh, of different things like studies of volume conduction and anisotropy that understand how the currents move on and selection of electrode materials, then current stability and charge density, electrophysiological and bolt estimation of excitability. I'll tell you what it is. Physiological current spread and bolt excitation fields and so on and so forth. Now the state of the art today is rio based Cronach C excludes, as you're gonna see again, smooth muscle contraction within, w when you want to use the bolt, you wanna make sure when you stimulate a tissue that you don't stimulate actually the muscles of the vessels because it's gonna give you also signals and the signals are irrelevant to the um, true processing of neural information. Then you have overlap of uh, physiologically measured and bolt defined current spread. Uh, bolt fields are only by 2.5 millimeters. You expect that because of the um, relationship of the bolt to the field potentials rather than to the spiking activity. And to the positive uh, bolt reflects actually field potentials and the negative reflects mostly drops of MUA, basically population activity. Now, what um, <coughs> I'm gonna be talking about, I'll tell you about um, the stimulation of striate cortex, stimulation of thalamic nuclei, you'll see why some pharmacological studies they try to understand what exactly is happening when you have up or down stimulation of the uh, metabolic signals, optogenetic stimulation of LGA and corneal system, and of course, if we ever have time, we can talk a little bit about stimulation of hippocampus and, and uh, locus ceruleus. Now, we start with a visual system. Uh, are there people here that have been working with that? Is this too boring? Should I skip it? Uh, yes or no? I don't. Should I continue? Yes? Okay, all right. So, um, the, here's everything wonderful except my uncomfortable <laughs> the screen. Uh, you mean it's a mouse or what? Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, I'll try with this too, okay. So uh, in all cases, all right, the information, the visual system, guess it starts basically by, uh, and by light entering the retina. And you have the, in the back basically here the retina, we has different kind of cells that do amazing things before actually they send a signal to the thalamus. Uh, but in the end, after doing all these amazing things, they end up sending basically action potentials, activation, boom, 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 it's like a firing and it goes towards the center of the brain. And as you may know, any sensory information from any system has the tendency, there are rare exceptions in certain cases, to go to what people call the thalamus. This is, by coincidence, a Greek word that means actually space, but in Greece was used in a way that it means pre-space, it's like pre-thalamus, you know. It, which means that people are coming there, you tell them, okay, sit here, please, and then uh, after, you know, the, 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 the turn comes, they have to enter into the appropriate room and talk more and do whatever they want to do. So this is the way it's called thalamus, and the information goes first to the thalamus, and from the thalamus, that goes back to the cortex, uh, to different areas, well, up to the cortex, back to the cortex. The visual information goes from the retina to the lateral geniculate bodies, right and left, and from there, with this huge, basically, projection, optical radiation, it goes to the back of the brain. And this is almost identical in humans and monkeys. And it's the best, uh, basically, experimental model, the monkey, because the whole organization, as you're gonna see, the hierarchical organization, the topographic organization, are probably indistinguishable. The only difference is the representation of the central visual field in the monkeys is in the lateral surface between as you're gonna see in a minute, this lunate and the inferior occipital sulcus somewhere here. And in humans, because there was a huge growth of the frontal lobes, this is pushed backwards. And in the humans, basically the representation of the visual field is almost in the pole of the occipital lobe. But beyond that, actually the initial organization, the organization is practically identical. Now, 
What is interesting and made this system so appropriate for debugging, so to speak, the electrical stimulation of the magnet is this uh, hierarchical that I'm gonna tell you, but also this topographical organization. You probably know that here is uh, from uh, Gordon Holmes, and this is basically a map of the field that is precisely in, the, in humans in the lateral surface of the calcarine sulcus here. And this whole mapping was done, it was because of the perverse, basically, war industry that developed spinning bullets. I don't know if you know that. And the spinning bullets was the first bullets that could penetrate your head and go and hit the wall, and you wouldn't necessarily die unless they hit a very critical center. So because it was spinning, they did, they did not only have very high penetration ability, but also they melted many of the capillaries. So in the, you're not dying because of bleeding. And because of that, there were a lot of patients, a perverse thing actually, but it's true that a lot of patients were with different types. One had a missing part here, another had a missing part here, another had a missing part. And this guy has been studying in detail in a very efficient and nice way, basically, the, um, the causes and the results of this kind of um, injuries. And he figured out that basically if you if this part is missing, your damage is exactly here, nowhere else. And if this part is missing here, the damage is exactly here, the central representation, as I said, is in the top. And the upper, basically, visual field is in the down, in the, in the lower part, and the um, lower field is in the upper part. Now, we, this has been, of course, verified in many, many animals, and of course in the monkeys. And as I told you, the only difference is here the center is in the pole, and here the center is laterally. But there is a complete, detailed, absolutely admirable representation of space uh, on the surface, basically, of the cortex. <coughs> now, the topographical organization that, as you're going to see, continues in many, many visual areas is one, the hierarchical organization, that means a very nice and ordered connectivity between areas that do a few things and areas that do a lot of things, is also very characteristic in the visual system. You see here the area V1, the primary visual cortex. I suppose you know, but just in case, primary means is the area that um, largely receives most of the thalamic input. You have the sensor information, the eye, or your basically touch, or whatever your uh, olfactory system. It goes to thalamus, as I said. From thalamus, it goes to the cortex. The very first cortical spot that receives this information, it is called the primary sensory area. And in this case, it is the V1, the visual area one. And as you see, there is V2, V3, V4, uh, IT, some other areas. Now. This here, if they sound a lot to you, is a small fraction of the areas because most of the areas are actually hidden. And people have developed, you know, that because you work with uh, MRI, all these methods basically of um, unfolding a cortex and generating basic very nice maps. And you see there are many, many areas, 40 to 55, depending on who you listen to, uh, areas that are specialized and they have a very hierarchical connectivity. And this is not just an empty word. Hierarchical connectivity means that the, the upgoing, the feed forward connections, they go basically from the previous area or from even from the thalamus to the granular, to the middle layer of cortex. And from there, they go up. And then from up, they go to the next area. The feedback connections, they go back, but they don't go to the granular. They spare granular layers. They go to the top and the bottom layers. So this organization is so precise, admirably precise, that you can very well say this area is here and this area is here, this is a higher area, this is a lower area. But this is only one part of the story. The other part of the story is the specificity of the cells. As you know, most of what we know, even when we do imaging, is coming from animal studies that kind of describe the properties. They don't tell you the rules. They don't tell you the dynamic organization of systems. They don't tell you how you should be seeing brain activity to understand a state. But they tell you, in this area, you see cells that do this and this and this. Mostly, statistically, you can basically ensure that the cells in the primary visual cortex, they will respond to oriented lines. 
which was a spectacular way the people got Nobel Prize for that. It was spectacular discovery because in the beginning they were just used to present things in the retina and have something in the retina. You present a spot, you get response. You don't present a spot, you don't get response. And they were presenting for months and for a year almost spots and trying to understand how cortex is going to respond to it. And there were no responses until a slide that they used to put. There were no computers back then had a break, and as the break went through the cell, receptive field, the cell did <laughs> And the guys were shocked to see what happened here. And then they pulled actually the slide up, nothing happened, because it was also directional. And they put it back again, <laughs> and said, yeah, either we drank too much today, or there is something actually strange in the whole story, and this led to a series of wonderful studies. And we know now that there is a map, and this map has cells that can be orientation selective, they can be disparity selective, difference between the eyes can be direction, motion selective, all these things. If you go to V2, the sophistication of responding to contours becomes responses also to basically illusory contours. You see here there's no contour, but you perceive a line here, right? And you perceive basically here a square, despite the fact there's no square, all these uh, very nice uh, optical illusions. So in V2, the cells start becoming sensitive to this kind of context, and they may show orientation selectivity for non-existing but perceived lines, okay? And if you go to another area that's called V5 or MT, then you're gonna see the cells are highly selective to the direction of motion and to the speed of motion and to what kind of composition the moving objects may have. So a very sophisticated system that deals with motion. This is not your motion perception. At least don't ever cite me for having said that MT is responsible for, for perceiving motion and all this blah, blah, blah that you, you may hear. Uh, but for whatever reasons that we don't still 100% understand, a lot of areas have a very high specialization. They must have some kind of dominant but not exclusive role in your cognitive abilities. Now, there are areas higher up, they become really sophisticated. Here you see 300 objects. These are recordings that I've done myself 20, 30 years ago, whatever. And I know exactly how I was surprised in the beginning. I knew a little bit that there are, but but you know, we're going on and on and on and on, 300 objects, no response, no response. And suddenly in the sequence, basically, of the image, there are also the faces. And you see here the Marlon Brando is a Marlon Brando neuron here. But <laughs> the same neuron somehow thinks this monkey is Marlon Brando, which is not exactly <laughs> right. So uh, you see that there is a sophistication. The cell is capturing something that you don't know exactly what's capturing. Some common things, whether it is the looking or it is whatever, and it responds to this object in this very specific way. It does not respond. These are the best responses out of 300. In many cases, the response is zero. If the animal is trained with objects that don't exist, that you make yourself, th there were many studies we published with objects that were manufactured basically by doing image processing. And you see that you go to the area, you can record three weeks, and you get no responses. You present the weird objects that the animal was trained with, and he can very well recognize them under all kind of viewing conditions. You can get specific responses. So is this basically the object recognition area? No, once again, no, big no, all right? But one has to take into account this specialization because it helps actually when you try to have a whole idea as how the system might be organized. This kind of uh, topographical and hierarchical organization led to this. And what you see at the right, you don't need to worry, you don't need to learn anything or to remember anything. All what it tells you is each one of the squares here is one of these areas. Some of them are at the same hierarchical level. You see here, they stay approximately at the same level. And they have all these connections. Some of them are feed forward, some of them are actually feedback, and so on and so forth. Now, this here, it's one of the connectivity charts. David Van Essen and his colleagues, Fellerman, have done this. And there are things like that right now, also basically morphed or changed in three dimensional to be more fancy than that. Uh, but it's help because you know that the anatomical connectivity is about 90%, if not 95%, as described in these charts, the anatomical connectivity. There are still anatomical details that we do not know. And anatomy is not sufficient because the 
strength of the connectivity depends very often on the global context of the activation. So here is what we did when we started, having all this background that I tried to give you in a short time. Uh, we said, okay, what we're gonna do, we're gonna go and stimulate the primary visual cortex. This here, um, my own experience, something like two, three degrees in, uh, here is the right part, in the left of the field. Now, the reason this is very good in the visual system, first of all, you can put your electrode before you stimulate and map exactly the position of the receptive field. You put the electrode here, and if this here is the center, I have a cross here, the center of the field, you put here in the right, in an eccentricity of approximately two degrees, that is more or less close to the horizontal meridian. You know that if, again, this is the axons, somewhere here you're gonna have the receptive field. You can measure the receptive field of the single cell or the population of the neurons, and you can almost pre-draw a small region and say, okay, somewhere here, I, if I stimulate correctly, I have to see this activation that's approximately here. But it goes beyond that. You can say, okay, there are maps in V2 as well, and in V3, and in V4, and you have almost four or five basically here, uh, hierarchical levels at which you have this kind of mapping. And what you say, okay, if I know what I'm doing and my electrical stimulation makes any sense, then the moment I stimulate this point here, I should see activation in V2, and I can tell you beforehand where this activation should be. First of all, because I can measure it electrophysiologically. Second, because meanwhile, we have a good representation of the topography of the areas. We know a priori where should be zero, where should be one degree, where should be two degrees, okay? And with all that, in the back of the head, you say, okay, if my stimulation makes sense and it's correctly done, then I go here and I expect this and this and this and this. And this is indeed what happens. If you go with a simple stimulation without anything sophistication before you start the whole thing, and you have also acquisition, simultaneous acquisition of images, you're gonna see that by stimulating this location here, you stimulate V1, through the lateral connectivity, you have also other things that are being stimulated. And then the corresponding, basically topographically corresponding spots in B2 and in B3, and also in area MT that receives information from B1, are activated. And these are the good news. You say, okay, something works. And then you see your bolt signal, and your bolt signal has basically these responses. And if you do a lot of things that we can discuss later on, you can make the bolt signal much, much better than it's typically described even by the MRI people because it's not as lousy and slow as people think. Uh, even, even good people like Gary Glover, you know, he has a basically um, impulse response function, I asked the hemodynamic response that is almost half an hour. You know, it's a huge thing to go here, it goes there and then it goes down and then it goes up again, meanwhile you are sleeping. And it's not exactly true. <laughs> because there is a confusion that has nothing to do with, with, with technology. It has to do with the fact that simple sensory stimulation causes neuromodulatory stimulation, something very slow, and to which the MRI is extremely sensitive, because it causes, causes volume transmission. That means instead of synaptic, basically, transmission of information, you have varicosities in the axons, they spread something that goes to a large area, and this is metabolized slowly, and you get things that actually respond to some extent to what you see and what you describe, but this is not exactly the limitation of the Bolt system. The Bolt system is about three times faster than it has been described, and its relationship to the signals, if you know which signals to choose, is quite encouraging for those that want actually to use imaging and understand more about the underlying neural activity. So you have the responses and you have here the three-dimensional basically reconstruction uh, it, that shows you which area on the cortex has been activated. You go then to MT, this other area, and if you stick an electrode in MT, you have here four levels that are in this the color code that basically slices that show you that if you stimulate MT, you have activation of the um, FST and other area in the fundus of the uh, temporal sulcus, in the colliculus, in V1, V2, the posterior occipital, in the MST, and all these things, they show basically that your um, 
your uh, activation, the electrical activation is sensible. It, it's not something crazy. It's not uh, shutting down things or whatever at, at the first glance. And also that you can use actually the stimulation to generate some maps that show you that activation of a particular spot in V1 and V2, it's kind of trivial because we know what you're gonna see. But when you start going to the areas that are not trivial at all and you don't know much about the direct and indirect connectivity, you can say, okay, this is a result that's not just a publishable result, but a result that increases the knowledge to some extent. Okay, all great with one little small exception as usually is just basically the training that you need not to get frustrated in life because every time you think that you did something, there are another 10 things that you seem not to, that they seem not to be exactly according to what you would expect. So this is here population data and you have stimulation of V1 and here population data and you have stimulation of, of MT. Now, you don't need to remember a damn thing here about names and anything. I can tell you all the, all the red things that you see here are the areas in more than 10 animals, more than 50, 60 sessions, um, the areas that have been again and again activate, activated in a very reasonable way, in a way that you could predict from what you know about the circuitries. And the same thing happened in MT, but all these areas are monosynaptic connections to the stimulated area. I remember a postdoc that was working, he came to me and he said, oh, it's great, should I send it to nature? I said, so why is the rest of the brain not seeing anything? Oh, what rest of the brain? <laughs> you know, there is more here that receives information Sorry for the expression, you know what I heard? Because <coughs> he was a very smart person. He, oh, shit. I said, yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so <laughs> let's start the discussion again. Now, jokes aside, this was quite impressive because very, very robust. And the question, of course, if you see that is, can direct electrical stimulation induce excitation of cortical afferents propagating cortex? Or you have a problem. You go to the first synapse, and after the first synapse, the first target, there's no way to propagate. Okay, you can do that, but you can try to see whether this is the case. But of course, the very, very, very first thing that we thought, all of us, including the, the postdoc, that we started big discussions about, they said, so back to the question that people have been asking for the last 60 or 70 years. And here maybe even more complicated because we are in the magnet environment. What is stimulated, first of all? Before we go into what is traveling and why stopping there or not continuing or doing whatever, so what is stimulated? And there is a really, really nice, actually, uh, paragraph written by James Rank. If you ever want to read something about the biophysics of electrical stimulation, his paper, papers, most of them in the 70s or beginning of 80s, are excellent examples. And of course, there are more technical, sophisticated things, but he has a very nice way to describe things. So what he said is electrical stimulation of the, say, lateral hypothalamus, it is a shorted version uh, of the statement that there is a stimulating electrode in the uh, lateral hypothalamus, which affected an unknown number and unknown kinds of cell at unknown distances in the vicinity of the electrode. And he's right. And what is not very nice is that he is almost still right with small improvement. It's extremely difficult, and as you're gonna see, this is not specific to direct electrical stimulation, but you can find the same problems with the optogenetical stimulation that people now advertise in different types of problems. But there are always problems and it's part basically of your work if you stay in research or you wanna have methodological developments to find some kind of um, getting out of these, uh, of these uh, traps that you have continuously. So um, not only is this a problem, but about 40% is a dramatic problem even for the applications. 40% of all 
you know that the Parkinson's patients, they come to a point where they, 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 their life is miserable. And when you cannot basically use pharmacological approaches, the only thing you can do is do surgery, implant something, go basically to different structures, STN, the subthalamic nucleus, or other parts of the uh, basal ganglia system, and, and stimulate. And, 40, and when you stimulate and you find the right spot, then the whole tremor and everything and the rigor stops. And this has the following problem. In 40% of the cases, it works, and it works for 10, 20, or the whole life of the patient. In 60% of the cases, either it starts again or even worse, you get all kind of horrible disease, including schizophrenia, obesity, everything you can possibly imagine. Why? Because, as everybody knows, and basic research is the thing to do, is we do not have a deep, serious understanding of how to place electrodes, what to do, how to stimulate, what kind of, of approaches to use in order actually to target the structure that we want. Very often we target a lot of things that are neighboring basically structures that should not be stimulated at all, but they are because of the lack of specificity that we have. Now, to give you an example here, there's a nice example that actually James Rank had collected. I, I added new literature and so on, but he first collected it. This is from studies that had the prerequisites of making a serious claim. Serious claim you can make if you really have access to data that show that what you stimulate it has effects, and these effects are not through other neurons directly from the neuron that has been activated, if you, even if you record with intracellular basically cells. That you don't have anatomical connectivity that pretty much basically makes your question invalid. That you don't have this, that you don't have this. So there's a list of things. And the studies that gave the first and later with my own additions, they gave uh, basically this um, example that I'll show you. They are not more than 12 or 13 studies in 40 years. They had all the conditions you can say something serious. Now, if you have basically here, uh, in the x-axis you have the current that you pass in microamps, and on the y-axis you have the distance in micrometers. And you see basically from the shaded areas that there are areas within which you can activate at different distances different neural elements. If you select a pulse of 200 microseconds and the duration of the pulse when you stimulate, as you're going to see, is critical, then you can have activation of small unmyelinated axons at 160 micrometers, different types in between, and you can have large myelinated axons that are activated in 1.8 millimeters. So all these things have to be taken into account. And of course, the very first thing that we did was to go back again and see how much you can do biophysically and with the fMRI to say exactly what is being stimulated and to what extent. And the very first thing you have to do is to understand the excitability of tissues on the basis of imaging. Now we use MRI, what is your specialty, to say whether we activate axons or we activate basically cell bodies, right? And how do you do that? Okay. You can do that with electrophysiology, which we did to have the control, and you can do that with even behavior, or you can do it by basically muscle activation, but here we wanted to do it by using imaging. So what you do is you have the current here in microamps, and you have here the volume that was activated when you do with fMRI with precise basically reconstruction of the gray area that has been activated. And if you select at 400 microseconds, there is a relationship, as you're going to see, between duration and the strength of a pulse. If you, you do that and you start with small, basic currents, uh, you're going to increase the currents and it's going to be an increase in the activated volume. And then you come to a plateau. And after that, you can bombard the tissue. You're not going to have more activation unless you cause damage or you do other things. Now, if you decrease the duration of the pulse, the curve is going to be shifted to the right. So that means there is a um, compensation between the strength of the pulse and the duration of the pulse. And what happens here, you select a threshold and you say, my threshold, I consider threshold of activation, let's say 40% of the 
of the maximum possible. It's always the same, as you see, no matter what you do. The, the curve is shifted, but this is always the same. So you say 40% is my threshold. And you take this threshold and you plot it, the threshold here, against the pulse duration. You have a very nonlinear function and it has an asymptotic level. And here the asymptotic level is called Rio base. It tells you basically the strength, the um, uh, pulse duration for which no matter what you do with, um, with the strength of the stimulus, you cannot activate anything. Now, this is all okay. It may look like, okay, time wasting, but it is not because there is another thing here that you get if you go two times the Rio base and you measure the time, this time, it's called chronoxy that it tells you basically what is the duration of a pulse which is strength two times the real base. Then this particular duration is signature of the, act of, the, uh, of the type of the activated elements. So if you get something like 200 until 400 microseconds, you know 100% you are activating ax axons. You can go into more detail, see whether they are myelinated or unmyelinated, but you know you activate axons, and specifically you activate what people call the axon hillock. This is where the body ends, and you have the beginning of the axon. There's a huge concentration of calcium channels. And if you activate here, basically, it's very sensitive. It will propagate the signal and will go to the next target. So, and if you do that with the fMRI, you see that you get very, very nice results accurate results, you don't get frustrated with the method, as others may think. You have a real base of 456 microamps and a chronoxy of 221 that we verified physiologically and verified with muscle activation, we verified behaviorally. So indeed, if we use these conditions, we can be sure that we're gonna have activation of axons, and this is important because this is what's gonna go to the next state. You want to activate axons in an area in order to transfer the information further on. Now, the very second question is how much do you activate? I won't take too much of your time because all these things, they require a lot of details, but I can tell you that the line here is from many, many physio good physiological studies. They show basically the relationship between the current amplitude and the radius of the activated region. And if you see where the bolt is, is above, and this difference the fact that you have 2.5 to 2.8 times larger activated volume is very well predicted by the relationship of the bolt signal to the field potentials that we'll talk about in the next talk. So last out of many, many things, I'm not going into all details, uh, is what is the pulse that you are passing to the tissues? You may say, why should you ask that? Well, because you're in the magnet. And you use basically shielded cables that have very, uh, very um, long length. And look how the signal looks. The green is what you think you are passing to the tissue. What you're really passing is the blue line because of filtering, right? So what you have to do is you have to develop the methodology that estimates during the stimulation by measuring impedance and all the other things what is the current, it's gonna look something funny and much larger with a very uh, funny shape that will give you the best approximation to the green signal and this the red signal and this red signal indeed is what you need to do to stimulate the tissues and you then have to select the pulses and after you do all these things, the state of the art becomes that current estimation of pulse shape and strength is correct on the basis of fMRI LFP, MUA base excitability measurements are similar to those obtained with fMRI. Activated are axons and not smooth muscles because the chronoxy would not be 220 microseconds, it would be something like seconds with muscles. And fMRI estimated current spread is consistent with the relationship of the bolt signal to the field potential recordings. So that means Whatever you saw in the weird results of monosynaptic connectivity are due to the brain and not to the imaging. And we'll see what that is. How do you do that? Well, the first thing we wanted to do is get out of the cortex. 
because it's complicated with all this basically two-directional connectivity, all these things, it's, a, it's almost a hopeless case to try to understand how to stimulate the input of the cortex. So we go to LGN, to the thalamus, that sends the information to the cortex. And we say, if what we saw is correct, then indeed the signal is gonna go from the thalamus to the cortex, we'll stop there. Is this true? And you see here the LGN has exactly the same maps that you have in cortex. You see here basically the left one has the right, um, the right um, uh, visual field, and the lower part of the field is the medial part of the LGN, and the foveal representation is in the, in the posterior part of the LGN. And the connectivity is such that if you have a spot activated in your retina, you'll have a spot here, a spot here, a spot here, a spot here. If you activate correctly, you don't activate arbitrary tissues, you're gonna have a spot here, and you can predict where it's gonna go in the visual cortical areas. So we did it all as precisely as we can, and we went to LGN, all basically anatomically also verified, but also physiologically, you measure the properties of the neuron, the characteristic properties, and you stimulate. And what do you see? You see that if you stimulate LGN, you have activation of LGN, of superior colliculus, interesting thing, because the superior colliculus does not receive any projection for LGN. So we have to answer the question, where is he getting the information of LGN being activated? A stimulation of pulvinar and other associational thalamic nucleus and of V1. What happens after V1? Deactivation, negative bold responses. So basically, the very first results, they appear to be 100% correct, there is a tendency in the system, for whatever reasons that you're gonna see, not to propagate signals. It basically limits the capacity of, of using the combination of electrical stimulation and fMRI for connectivity studies, not because of fMRI or the physiology, but because of something related to the structure and connectivity of the brain. And now, the very first thing, of course, you do before you try to understand exactly what's happening, you make sure, again, that there are no artifacts. And what we did is we wanted to actually ensure, oh, I hope time is passing by very fast. Okay. Sorry? Yeah. Okay. So, but I, I think I have to, okay, I'll be skipping things. If you have questions, you can ask me. So what you see here is that this, this uh, activation and deactivation is independent of animal state. It doesn't matter whether the animal is anesthetized, what anesthetics you use, whether it is alert. And in both cases, you have exactly the same pattern. So definitely you're not basically um, hampered by some kind of special conditions that you use for the experimentation. The other thing is independent of current intensity. You can have here three different, uh, four, whatever, five, how many have different current intensity experiments. You can select the one that basically is um, a activation with the smallest possible current. And if you do that, you'll see that if you use only those voxels that were activated in all conditions, you're gonna get basically an increase of the amplitude of the bolt as you increase basically the intensity of the stimulation a small decrease, but not, it's basically the same, almost the same, a little less than the same, basically deactivation of the uh, disynaptic areas. Now, before I move on, I need to clarify one thing. The negative bold response you see has nothing to do with the typical negative bold responses that people reported in imaging. And we actually, years ago, was one of the first papers, uh, showed exactly what the neural basis of this negative bolt response is a massive drop of population multi-unit activity. And uh, what you do when uh, what you see in, in normal visual stimulation, you present a stimulus, let's say here, and this is, is a small thing, it causes um, perifoveal, parafoveal basically activation. In the perifoveal, the one that goes in, in higher eccentricities, shows this negative bolt response. And here you put that with a large, basically, a visual stimulus. It activates the periphery. And as you see, there is a negative bolt in this particular area. And as I said previously, this is very well, actually, these positive bolt responses and the negative bolt responses very well uh, um, correlate with the changes of the mass 
multi-unit activity. Now, this kind of behavior, and as we discussed in, the, in, in detail in the paper, uh, in the behavior, this kind of response behavior that is correlated to lateral connectivity and partly only also to uh, neurovascular effects is absolutely not related to what I show you with the stimulation. In fact, with a sensor input, you activate here something, and in the vicinity, something else is deactivated, and then there are a, a, a activation and deactivation relationships between these and higher stages, and then you have here activation of this activated area. Uh, you'll see the same activation in the corresponding topographically organized area in the extrastriate cortex. So this is one thing. What you see in the case of the stimulation, you have basically activation of a particular area, and this activation does not propagate anymore. It has nothing to do either with the sides, with the lateral connections of this area, or with the top-down connections. And you can very well understand that if you use this mixed restrictive GLM design. So what we did, we had stimuli that are alternating randomly or that co they can co-occur. And then in the analysis, you only analyze the voxels that are positively activated through the visual stimulation. So if you do that with the alternating, you see the visual response here is going to cause an activation in the area V1 and, of course, an activation in the area V2. If you use the electrical stimulus with exactly the same vo vo um, voxels that were never actually negatively activated, um, you're going to have an increase with the visual stimulus and a decrease with the electrical stimulus in the extra stride in the second synapse, so to speak. And the same thing you see if you have co co-occurring stimuli. Here you start with a visual stimulation, and at this point you have simultaneous visual stimulation and electrical stimulation. And in one case, you're going to have further enhancement of the volt activity, and in this case, you're going to have a decrease of the volt activity. This here shows the results for all the experiments we have done. And you see here with this um, restricted analysis, the LGN uh, is going to be the superior colliculus and the pulmonar. They are going to be consistently activated. V1 is going to be consistently, uh, and, and this with visual stimulation, this here is with uh, electrical stimulation. V1 is going to be activated in both conditions, and this one here, it will be activated with a visual stimulus, but deactivated with the electrical stimulus. Now, this here is just only additional to see the dramatic difference between visual stimulation and the electrical stimulation. It's very restricted, and it targets only monosynaptic spots. Now, the question is, what happened it happens at the cellular level. The big advantage of developing and using this methodology is that you can go back and forth and simultaneously and try to understand what exactly is happening in an area that you see a positive or negative bolt. And you see here the very first thing that the red line here shows basically the electrical pulse. The moment you pass an electrical pulse, there is a huge drop now, basically, of the multiple unit activity and of spiking activity in general, even single units. And then there is a gradual, small, basically, relapse. You have basically recovery. And the same here with another example. Now, if you have a lot of single cell responses, you can cluster them using all kinds of clustering methods. And if you do that, you see that about 45% of the responses, they're going to show a huge decrease in the unit activity that is slowly recovering and goes towards the zero after seconds. In, in addition, there are two types of responses, a brief, basically, inhibition, followed by a rebound, and a very small excitation. What is even more interesting is that each one of these classes is a different, uh, is a different cortical layer. So the ones that are severely inhibited are the, the cortical, the supragranular layers. These are the layers that are supposed to send information to the other area. So if you block them, there is no transmission of information from the first area to the second, to the third, and so on. And 
these are close to the granular and these are exactly the granular layers. And the granular layers, sure enough, they will be activated because they reflect the input. And the input is nothing else but the pulse that you gave in the LGN electrically. So you get an activation of the input. I hope I'm clear. You are here. Why? So, um, what is causing the inhibition? Do you have excitability changes? What does that mean? You stimulate the tissue, you tell it to send an unusual pulse. Do you change something in the ability of the neurons to actually make the Okay, I apologize. Yeah. Do you, do you do something funny that changes the physiological properties of the membranes of the post-stimulation post sites? Or you have synaptic inhibition. What does synaptic inhibition mean? It means you activate neurons, but for whatever reasons, you activate also inhibitory neurons, and the inhibitory neurons have the funny role of inhibiting the projection cells. So which one is true? Well. The very first thing you can do with the existing data before you design other experiments is you can say, okay, I want to see the recovery of, from the inhibition for different pulse duration and different strengths. If you have excitability changes, the bigger pulses, they're going to cause slower recovery. But this is not the case. And if you see all the parameters, you see there is not much of a change in the parameters showing that most likely what you do is not changing the excitability properties of neural elements, but it must, getting, it must be getting the synaptic mechanism and the interactions between excitatory and inhibitory neurons actually going. How can you check? Well, one way to check is to block inhibition. You put something and you inject a substance that tells to the GABAergic neurons, now you shut up. And we wanna see what's gonna happen without the inhibition actually changing anything in the activity. So what happens indeed if you do, first of all, before I do that, is I'll show you the injection. You see here the injection, this with Magnavist, with a contrast agent, just to show where basically the GABAergic um, inhibitor is going, okay? Now, you're gonna tell me, why did you show that? Just to show you as an MRI much? Well, you will understand what you show because we spent two weeks not getting any results until I got really pissed. <laughs> and I said, we'll do this and we'll see what the hell is happening. Look what's happening actually. It's not going to the cortex, right? So what's the difference? The difference is the amount you inject, in case you ever get involved in experiments, and the speed with which you inject it. So all these things, they are in your way. I'm more interested to talk about the scientific methodology with you than about actually this is the big result. So you see here, if you use the one that people have been describing for 30 years, nothing is going to the cortex. It's too much and it goes back. You have this here, here's the injection, the opening, and it goes back again. And it goes to the sub -PL space and nothing goes to cortex. I don't even know how they publish results. <laughs> it, it goes here and it just doesn't do what it's supposed to do, okay? But if you do it very slowly and you select the speed and it is the result of many experiments, then you're gonna see that indeed you have spread of the substance you want in the entire cortex of two to 2.5 millimeters. Now, you can do this, and then you can check with the substance that immediately can be visualized, and this is something that anesthetizes the cortex. Lidocaine is one of the local anesthetics, and you see very nicely, this is consistent with this one here. If you put lidocaine there, reversibly you inactivate the cortex, you get basically a blue, and the rest is actually red, okay? So that means, we know what we are doing, nothing else. 
So let's see now what we're going to get, because supposedly we know what we are doing. And you do that, and I won't go into the details, but we use here independent component analysis because it's relatively difficult to a priori have any models. So we use that, and we split the regions into injected region, non-injected regions in the primary visual cortex. In the second area that receives information, you have in the, the injection projection zone, IPZ, the information that goes from the area that is now different, and then you have the areas that are unaffected. You get these things that if we go into the details, they will tell you what you're going to see here, but it's better to see the averages directly. You see that B1 is actually activated in both cases, and here is um, the V2 that is inactivated, as you know, and we go here, and before the injection, the V2 is, of course, the IPZ of the V2, the one that receives, actually, the, um, the, uh, the injection, the, pro the projection of neurons that were injected. Before the injection, you have this negative fault that I described several times. Look what's happening after. Here, the bolt is positive, and the physiological responses are positive, everything consistent. And why is it positive, if I were, if I were clear enough? Because you block the inhibitory neurons. You shut the mouth of the GABAergic cells and you get the signal going to the next area. Something, of course, that you cannot do with the entire brain. Does not necessarily mean that you have a solution of how you can fix the direct electrical stimulation, but at least you know what's happening. And these are population neurons uh, population results from all the sessions, it's a really massive and consistent thing, a very strong inhibition in the second visual area, and very strong excitation with all the regions that had blocked inhibitory neurons. Now, what is that telling us? It's telling us that this of B1 afferents disrupts the propagation of signals from B1 to extrastriate cortex, hence they get negative bolt response, correct. The findings are independent of animal state and current strength. Death induced down modulations are unrelated to negative bolt response observed during sensory stimulation. Disrupted propagation due to synaptic inhibition is due to synaptic inhibition rather than excitability changes. And the MUA drops in the supra and briefly um, and briefly increases. Sorry, I forgot something here. Um, in in the infragranular cortical layers. And finally, this is the profile of spikes that is reduced during this activity and the electricity are increased. And of course now, you can say, what is the, do, 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 you, do we know this is something we understand? Well, I think this is the best example how Sometimes very interesting and nice results, and, uh, and, and new results. They actually help a particular subfield that is oriented uh, towards answering a particular question, and they can be hugely ignored by many, many other fields, despite the fact that they're directly relevant and critical. So here there's a study by Ron Douglas and Kevin Martin that was done 40 years ago whenever. And what they did is they stimulated the axons in, of uh, the visual cortex in cats, and they measured basically intracortically all the responses with all details. So they described it in a very nice way that if you stimulate the axon, what you see in the cell in cortex is, first of all, a very small, brief increase, is like the cells that I told you in the input layers, that is immediately followed by a fast inhibition that is specific to GABA-A receptors. These are ionotropic receptors information propagation. This is followed by a long-lasting inhibition of GABA-B metabotropic receptors that takes quite a bit, as I showed you previously. It can go to one second or something. So why do you have this? And why do we ignore it? Well, we cannot ignore it, actually, because it tells you exactly how the cortical circuits work, and you can see that here. The very first thing is you have to take into account, when you read the textbook, they're gonna tell you the input from the thalamus goes to the granular layers. The correct way of saying it is the majority of the input goes to the granular layers. There is a spread of the information that goes all over the place, 
and it goes simultaneously to the GABAergic and to glutamatergic, basically, excitatory neurons. These are the neurons, the red ones, that send information to other areas. These are the neurons that basically are inhibitory and try to inhibit these neurons. Why do they try to inhibit them? This circuit that you see here is characterized by the strongest imaginable recurrence, as you can see here. There is an amplification of the signal. It comes, the reason there is amplification is what's coming from the thalamus, from all the huge world around you, is 10% from what the cortical area is. 90% is coming from other cortical areas or associational nuclei. So it's a small signal that needs to be amplified and it's amplified precisely because of the structure of the primary visual cortex. And it goes to a huge thing, and it would run away and have an epileptic fit if you didn't have this. So you have a fully balanced system that is characterized by homogeneous, diverse, and spread input by, um, by this uh, auto amplification through the recurrent circuitry, and the continuous balance between excitation and inhibition. Now, systems like that can only work properly if you respect time delays. The signal has to come first to excitatory neurons within two to three milliseconds, what I'm telling you has been measured. There was a very beautiful study some years ago in, in, in Nature Neuroscience by Okun and Lamp. They measured exactly with a special technique, and they know that the inhibitory neurons for the very same signal, they will be two to 2.3 milliseconds later than the excitatory neurons. And they're gonna basically modulate and control the degree of excitation of the projection neurons. If you null this difference, you cause an extremely strong inhibition, fit forward inhibition, and you block the system. So what is driving the V1 BBR, if this is true? Why do you see positive responses we, with what we just said? If we had a longer time to discuss, one of you would tell me, but, but you see positive responses in V1. Well, I show you the way we started the studies. And we started by using a standard stimulation protocol that uses 100 to 150 hertz, or sometimes 200 hertz, stimulation frequency. This has been used for 40, 50, 60 years. And you have to use it because people showed it works very well. But if you lower the frequency and you start with a single pulse, and you measure electrophysiological in cortex, and you say, what's happened? I pass, I pass one pulse in LGN, and I measure continuously in LGN. Then there is a highly nonlinear and non-monotonic function between actually the probability of generating a spike and the um, um, frequency that you pass. So the, as you see, it reaches a minimum around, let's say, four, five, between four and 10, depending on the, on the on the animal, and then it increases again. And so does also the inter spike, between the spikes, how much spontaneous activity you have. This is starting very low and is increasing after basically uh, 30 or 40 hertz. So what that means is that if the bolt actually follows exactly the neural activity, what you would expect in V2 it's not going to make any big difference. You're going to see basically a nonlinear relationship just like the one you see with physiology. But in V1, you expect different sign of bold response, of metabolic actually changes, if you have low frequency and high frequency. And this is indeed the case. It's quite amazing, but the system is very well reflected in the signals that you measure. And you have basically a drop in the signal for very low frequencies and an increase here. In both cases, you have inhibition. Nothing changed. The only difference is here you drop the general activity and the bolt drops. Here you drop the general activity, but by giving 100 hertz and 200 hertz, you increase the input. And the bolt is going to reflect that input. Here, 
you show that the input you are getting, despite the fact that you are shunting the circuits, is higher than the baseline activity. That's why you get a positive bold response. So here is the total results. You see what's happening here with 200 hertz, what I show you again and again. What's happening with 8 hertz, you're gonna have activation of the visual stimulus in V1 and in V2, and deactivation both in V1 and V2. Now, what uh, am I doing here with the time? Should I stop or? Okay, let me tell you what I have here. If I show them the whole story, it's gonna be probably another 20 minutes. Do you want to, or, should you, or you wanna take a break, whatever you like. <laughs> okay, all right. I just don't wanna be, you know, I have always the impression somebody's gonna come with his gun and tell me, can you shut up? <laughs> we don't wanna hear about the show again. <laughs> All right, so, um, okay, now uh, I'll, I'll skip the details of the diagrams and tell you that the characteristic question that you can ask under these conditions and with this complexity is you can ask the question, what happens if I stimulate another structure that doesn't have the strict hierarchical organization of the LGN V1 and so on? And you can go and stimulate the pulvinar. It's an associational nucleus, and I'll tell you about it because this is also something that is very often ignored, despite the fact that some very, very good investigators made clearly the point that these structures are at least as important as the cortical areas and their connectivity. So what's happening here? Very easy. Everything is activated if you stimulate pulvinar. And again, of course, it will be activated because you stimulate it 150 or 200 hertz. Back then we were doing this with these frequencies. And these are the results. And LGN is activated. Superior colliculus is activated. Pulvinar is activated. Of course, V1, V2, MT, and XC stands for extra stride cortex, all different areas that are disynaptic. Why? And this is a point actually to take home. These diagrams here with cortex, they led for many, many years to what people will call cortical chauvinism. People think that the signals from the sensory areas, they go to the thalamus, they go to cortex. Once they arrive to cortex, they stay in cortex, they don't go nowhere or anywhere else, that's it. So cortex then does everything, cortex is our smart thing and blah, 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 all these things. Now, the truth is a little different. An alternative hypo uh, hypothesis is that actually you take into account what different associational thalamic nuclei do. And you see here what's happening. The retina goes indeed to LGN, to the relay nuclei, and goes to layer four. And then we say it goes to the layer two and three, and from there it goes to V2, and then it goes to V2, V3, and then the cortical big business starts. But what really happens here is the layer four has projections to layer five, and layer five even receives sometimes direct information, and then it goes to the pulvinar. And the pulvinar now sends information to the area V2 with basically driver's connection. That means the receptors here that receive the information of the pulses are ionotropics. They are like the receptors that go from V1 to V2, from V2 to V3. They are not metabotropic, they are not modulators like the modul modulatory input that changes the SNR but doesn't transmit concrete information. So, and people have been doing wonderful work for years and they describe in detail this connectivity and they show that if you have basically um, the cortical mantle here and you have also here the pulvinar in the case of the pulvinar and you see how the mapping's done. Here in the um, lateral, Basically, in uh, direction, you have the foveal representation, the medial, you have uh, the um, um, V2 representation, uh, the V3 representation, whatever, all the extra stride cortex. And here you see them the way they are in cortex, as I showed you many times. And then you have two points that are being stimulated. If these two points are interconnected, without exception, they turned out to be interconnected also 
through the pulvina. So there are two pathways. The one goes indeed from cortical area to cortical area, as people thought. The one does this, but with, the ex with exactly the same systematicity. And there was a very nice, uh, Stuart Chimp had an, a review article and he said, uh, he called it the replication principle. If two cortical areas communicate directly, they are likely to have overlapping thalamic fields. If not, the thalamic fields avoid each other. They are totally separate or interdigitated. So that means you have a copy of the cortical maps with this one here, and this one here, on top of everything, has an output to motor areas. Probably over the evolution of millions of years, in the beginning you didn't even need to have the cortex. You had thalamus, you had some association, thalamic nuclei, and then you went to motor things because you want to move. And then you have a little more cortex. But then the second thing that you build in cortex gives also a thalamic output, and this thalamic output goes to the motor system. So you have multiple replicas of motor outputs from sensory and perception related information that runs not through cortical cortical, but through cortical subcortical cortical loops. That's why you see also with the stimulation, this vast stimulation, because you stimulate uh, retrogradely and anterogradely, um, um, orthodromically and uh, antidromically, all the connections of the pulvina. And here's basically the result. And the question, of course, is if, you st if, if, if all that is correct and uh, reflects the, the, the connectivity, what do you see in cases, indeed, of LGN where you stimulate subpopulations of the LGN that don't follow the typical rules, they don't go to the granular layers of cortex, and then they go to the other layers, but they can go directly to the top of cortex, or they can even skip the primary visual cortex and go directly to uh, area MT or area V2. Well, in such cases, what you see here is if your dominant basically stimulation pertains to the relay cells, then you have, oops, I'm sorry. Then you have, I don't see, uh, uh, okay. Ah, you see the green line, okay, sorry. Um, if the um, dominant stimulation is in the relay cells, then you're gonna have basically the inhibition that I showed to you. If the dominant stimulation is the corneal cells that are between the layers, I'll tell you in a second about them, then you're gonna see excitation in both cases, in V2 or also in MT. And the fact that this is not fantasy, you can see by doing optogenetic stimulation that can be specific to the corneal cells. So what are the corneal cells? The corneal cells are a weird subpopulation of neurons in the LGN that you can see here. In the top, you see the parvo, cell, the parvo cells, the ones that are very small, and in the, in the bottom, you see the magno cells. They have different properties. This is 80% of the neurons of LGN. This is 10% of the neurons of LGN. These are relay cells. They get the retina input and they send it further. But then you have some other cells here that are called corneo from sand because they're extremely small. And these cells, for whatever reasons that is unknown right now, have a control modulation type of role and they don't follow the typical scheme that you have with the relay neurons. And you can see that here, I'll skip it. You can label them with all these optogenetical methods. We don't have time to go into the details. You have parvalbumin, basically, sus um, sensitive neurons uh, in, the, in the relay neurons. You have these um, enhanced yellow Florence protein neurons. And if you superimpose them, you see very nicely you have separated location, basically, of different neuronal types. Now, if you go and you stimulate the system, basically, with blue light, if you stimulate the visual system, you're gonna see that the main sink, the main input, put this way, that comes to the area, is in the granular layers. And of course, then it goes to the other layers with some delay, as you're gonna see. This is closer to zero. And if you stimulate the corneal system, then you see basically that the activation happens in the top of cortex. And the very same thing here, if you do, I'll show you directly here. If you do the corneal stimulation, you're gonna see very, with the optostimulation, you'll, you'll see exactly what I show you. 
And if you do the uh, corneal stimulation with electrical stimulation, and I showed you, it's totally possible. You don't even need the optogenetic stimulation. You get this profile of activation of the top layers. So I think this shows here that if you have a lesion area, okay, I think I we should skip it. All right. So let's go here to, <coughs> to the final, basically, conclusions. The direct electrical stimulation of efferents of a cortical area disrupts the propagation of signals from the projection neurons of the area to the rest of the brain, including negative in inducing negative bolt responses. Disruption of propagation is due to strong synaptic inhibition rather than reduced excitability that follows the over-synchronized spatiotemporal profile of electrical stimulation elicited thalamic input. The use of high-frequency deaths increases pulse efficiency and cortical synaptic activity, demarcating all monosynaptic targets of stimulated brain site. You can use lower frequencies. You're going to get the blue spots. The blue spots give you 100% the monosynaptic connections of a particular stimulated area. Activation of polysynaptic targets likely reflects the antidromic stimulation of collaterals of intragranular projection neurons and the recruitment or ref of replicating pathways like the pulvinal that I show you. So behaviors induced with electrical stimulation or TMS likely reflect cortico-subcortical cortical pathways rather than direct cortico-cortical communication. And before I stop, I want to thank here the people that spent an enormous amount of time and in trying to uh, develop this whole methodology and apply it in this diverse way. Uh, these are the scientists. I don't have time to go into the details. And this is the machine shop. The machine shop has been really, really the biggest support because they do, we have an electronic shop, very big one, and a uh, machine shop, and they do everything you need to do these multimodal experiments. Thank you, okay, excuse me for the long talk.